chimney, Christmas. Hi. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so, uh, you guys like all iOS programmers? Is that what? I'm not seeing like uh, you know like like there's one guy who's saying you know. so or or do you like program an Objective C who, who who's an Objective C programmer oh look at that okay all right oh 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 who's ever programmed an Objective C oh okay all right how old is this language it was invented in 1980. Uh, so that would make it 36 years old. Who invented it? Brad Cox. Brad Cox. Why? He wanted a better C. He wanted a better C, as did Jarnus Strustrup, who invented C++ in what year? Same year, 1980. Um, Brad Cox was a small talk programmer, and he was forced to program in C. And he didn't like C, so he wrote a little preprocessor in front of C, which made it look like small talk. And he called it Objective-C. Jarnus Trustrup was a Simula programmer, and he was forced to program in C, and he didn't like programming in C, so he little, wrote a little preprocessor in front of C, made, and he called it C with classes. And then uh, about three years later, a buddy of his came to him and said, uh, you should rename this, because that's a bad name. And, and they named it C++, which seemed better. Notice the parallel development here. That's kind of interesting. Uh, Objective-C kind of became known before C++. So in the early 80s, when I was out, you know, a young programmer, uh, actually I was kind of old back then too, but <laughs> as a programmer of a certain maturity, I was you know, scouting around looking for interesting options because I'd been a C programmer for a while. And, and uh, there's this object stuff that people were talking about. And Objective-C was all the rage. Everybody was talking about StepStone, the company StepStone, and the IC packs they were selling. And I actually took a, a trip out to visit a company that was doing Objective-C back in 1980, some number. I can't remember what number it was. And, and it was very exciting. And then something bizarre happened. Jarnus Trustrup wrote a book. How many of you are C programmers? All right, now, you wait, if you're an objective C programmer, you're a C programmer, right? Okay, so, uh, and how many of you have read Kern, Han, and Ritchie? See there, right? Okay, so, uh, if you are a C programmer, you must have a copy of Kern, Han, and Ritchie, a K and R. You've got to have your K and R, and you have to know where it is. It has to be within 50 meters of you at all times. <laughs> and you know, that the table of operator precedence is on page 49, right? You just know these things. Uh, Kernahan and Ritchie's lovely book, it's a big, nice white book, uh, paperback, it's got a big blue C on the front. It does not have the words don't panic on the front, but it might as well. It's about 150 pages long. As you open it up, you find a very pleasant font, a nice format, um, and this was the real selling thing. It has a chapter zero. <laughs> All the geeks know. Oh, yeah. 1986, Jarnus Trustrup publishes a book, the C++ programming language. Now, it's not white. It's kind of a, a maroon color. And it's got, instead of a blue C on the front, it's got a big gold C on the front with two pluses. But it's still a paperback, still the same form factor. And when you open it up, it has the same font and the same layout and the same nice, nice readable language, and it's got a chapter zero. And all the C programmers go, oh, this is the next C. And they all abandon Objective-C. And they all go to C++ and Stepstone, the company that was trying to sell Sell Objective-C, Brad Cox's company, goes right down the tubes, and that should have been the end of it. Objective-C should have died at that moment and been left in the trash. <laughs> Except for an accident of history, which was that Apple had become relatively successful by then. 
He'd sold the Macintosh by 1983 and, you know, the Apple II before that, and they had billions of dollars. And Steve Jobs, a young man at the time, says to himself, you know, this company needs a real businessman to run this place. So he scouts out around and he, he hires possibly the most unlikely candidate he could think of, uh, a man named John Scully, who was the COO of Pepsi-Cola. Now, you might wonder why they would want to have the operations officer of a soft drink company running a high-tech computer company, but that didn't seem to occur to them at the time. Turns out that John Scully was not a particularly good CEO of Apple. He actually kind of drove it into the ground for a while. But he was politically astute enough to get Steve Jobs fired. And Steve Jobs, with several billion dollars in his pocket, says, well, I'll show those guys. So he founds a new company, which was called Next. And uh, he's going to make hardware. He's going to compete with Apple. He's going to bury those Apple bastards. And uh, he builds this hardware, and, he, and, and there's a bunch of guys out on the street, you know, holding up signs. We will code Objective C for food. So he hires them, <laughs> and they produce the Next Step operating system. Now, the whole enterprise is a dismal failure. Nobody buys the next machine. Nobody cares. You know, I knew of one company that bought one, and I own it now, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> But it didn't matter to Steve anyway, because uh, within a few years, Apple got rid of John Scully, and they went back to Steve and said, would you please come back, because we need some kind of creative influence here. And he said, I'm fine to come back, but I'm going to bring my whole team with me. And he brought all those old Objective-C programmers with him, and they brought the Next Step operating system with them, and they started working on iPads, iPods. <laughs> and so the whole language got resurrected, unfortunately. But there you go, that's the history. Why is it that we programmers are never happy with our language? Never. How many languages are there? Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, and tomorrow there will be hundreds more. Right? How many languages have been invented in the last five years? In the last five years, how many languages have come out? It's Swift and Go and Dart, and, and how many more? And how many more do we need? What is wrong with us? <laughs> We're always looking for the better language. And you know, what, what have we learned with these new languages? I mean, this new language comes out, and is it better somehow? Well, it's got features of this language, it's got features of that language, it's a little more type safe or a little less type safe, it's got more dynamic typing, it's got less dynamic typing. Bah! <laughs> Don't we, as a an industry need to stop this scatterbrain search for the golden fleece? Don't we need to at some point become adults and say, huh, you know, it'd be great if we could all speak the same language for the next 20 years without constantly having to rip everything up and throw everything away and tell our bosses, oh, you know, we've got to get the new language. Why? Because it's new. Well, I know, but is it going to buy us anything? Oh, yes, I'll be able to code much faster in the new language. Just watch. <laughs> oh, well, I'm ranting. And that's what I do. I rant. So uh, this is a talk about the future of programming. And I've got a little experiment to perform here before I begin. I would like all of the programmers in the room to please stand up. In a moment, I'm going to ask some of you to sit down, and I'm going to ask the rest of you to remain standing. It's a very simple decision, usually. I'd like all the men to sit down. Men. Good. Does anybody see a problem here? You, uh, ladies, you may now sit down. Thank you. What's wrong with that picture? Why is it that our industry is so incredibly male-dominated? Now, this did not used to be the case. Back in the uh, earliest days of software, women were roughly half the programmers that were there. Not quite, but almost half. And even when I was growing up, when I was a young programmer, um, first place I worked, 
maybe a third of the programmers there were women. And these were people that were not in their 20s. They were in their 30s to 35 to 40 or 45. They were mature people. All the programmers were. And I, I remember starting there as a kid of 18, and, and well, I'm surrounded by all these old people. <laughs> and some of them were women, and a lot of them were women. Within 10 years of that event, I was working at another company that had far more programmers. All of us were in our 20s, hardly anybody over 30, and maybe there were two or three women at the company. I had 50 programmers, maybe two or three women. What happened? Where did all the girls go? Where did all the women go? What's wrong with us that we are repelling half the people in the world? There's a problem here, and we're going to have to face this problem somehow. I'm not quite sure what it is. So I'm going to talk about the future of programming, and I want you to keep that little issue in mind, because we're going to come back to it in a moment. And that was the issue, so fine. We are going to begin by studying some history. We're going to go all the way back to um, 1948, and actually before that, too. And I wonder if the laser on this thing works. Huh? Oh, yeah, look at that. There I am. That's me. I was born in 1952, uh, just a few years after our starting point here. So here's our starting point, 1936. Alan Turing, and this, I start here arbitrarily because I know there was some computer history before that, but I start here for a very important reason. Alan Turing is probably the first person to write code that you and I would recognize as code that executed in an electronic computer, used binary as its instruction format, and you and I could look at it and say, yeah, that's code. So, here it is, 1936, and he writes this paper on computable numbers with an application to the Einstein's problem. Who's read this paper? So now there's a problem right there. You need to read this paper. It's a fascinating paper. The, it's a paper is, is remarkable. Uh, who's heard of Charles Petzold? Oh, yeah, one guy, oh, two, okay. Get another one back there. This is the guy who wrote all the MFC books in the 80s the Microsoft Foundation class books in the 80s. He's got a whole library full of Microsoft books. And I know he's a Microsoft guy. You don't want to read anything he wrote. But he's abandoned the whole Microsoft thing. Well, he hasn't really. He now works for Xamarin, so I guess that's kind of a Microsoft-y kind of thing, isn't it? But he wrote a book not too long ago called The Annotated Turing. And it's a remarkable piece of work. It takes Alan Turing's paper, and it chops it up into little tiny bits, and then surrounds it with lovely annotation of history and explanation of what's going on, and he walks you step by step through the paper, telling you exactly what Turing was explaining and why and what was going on. Absolutely beautiful piece of work. Both Turing's paper and Petzold's book. So I encourage you, get that book, The Annotated Turing and read it. I've read it twice. It's like, it's really that good. So here he is, and he has invented, by 1986, the concept of a computer that you and I would recognize as a computer. A little weird, you know, this funny little tape that goes back and forth, but still something that you and I would consider a computer. And then in this paper, he writes code that you and I would recognize as code. He invents other things as well. He invents subroutines. He invents macros. He invents variables. He uses binary. He is doing things that you and I would recognize. By 1939, Turing is working over at Bletchley Park at the code-breaking thing, and the kinds of machines he's using there to help break codes are machines that use relays. You see that relay there? Who's used a relay? Anybody here use a relay? A bunch of electronics people, good, okay. A relay is just a coil of wire, and if you pass current through that coil, you get a magnetic field, and the magnetic field will um, attract that little piece of metal right there. It's called the armature. It'll pull it in. And as it pulls it in, it grabs these switch contacts here and pulls the switch contacts in. So you can either open or close the switch contact by using an electric signal into the coil of that relay. Th these were invented for telegraphs. 
because the telegraph signal could only go so far, maybe 20 miles or so, and then you had to amplify the signal. And what they would do to amplify it is that they put a relay in there, and the relay would energize, and that would close a new switch on a new battery and send the signal another 20 miles. That's why they call it a relay. It relayed the signal. Now, a device like this can probably switch 10 times a second reliably. So the kind of clock rate, if you want to use that term, that Turing was able to get on his machines was something on the order of, um, you know, 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, something like that. It was a slow clock rate, but much faster than anything anybody could do by hand. So, okay. Vacuum tubes were there, but they were horrifically unreliable. Um, the, a lot of them couldn't hold the vacuum for long. The filaments would burn out quickly. They weren't very standard. They weren't being mass produced in enough quantity. They were fast, much, much faster than relays. But they were so unreliable that to put a circuit together with more than 20 vacuum tubes was just unrealistic. So most of the time they depended on on relays until late in the war where they started to try to use vacuum tubes. They built the Colossus out of that. They kind of got some results, but it wasn't very reliable. By 1945, though, they'd begun to solve some of those problems. The war was over. That's good. Uh, anybody recognize that machine? ACE? The automated computing engine. That was the first computer, or one of the very first computers ever. And it's Alan Turing working on this device. That's not Alan there, that's someone else. Notice the gender. The ACE was a machine that Alan Turing helped to design. He designed the instruction set. He designed the word width. He designed the concept of the machine. The machine would be able to add, not subtract. In order to subtract, you had to reverse the bits and add one to do a twos complement. Actually, Turing didn't even want it to add, because he felt it was probably good enough if you just had some simple uh, ors and ands and nots, and you could do an add that way. It's not that hard. So he just figured we, had, we should have logic operations, but some of the other hardware designers said, no, we better have an add, because those logic operations would take too long. And so they did put an add into the computer. Uh, what kind of memory do you think this machine used? Who's got a thumb drive in their pocket? Back there. How many gigabytes is it? Eight. Eight. What? How many byte? How, how many gigabytes do you have in your phone? How many gigabytes are in this room right now? <laughs> right now, how many gigabytes are in this room? Huh? There's, there's, I don't know, it's just an enormous number of gigabytes. And what are they doing at the moment? Nothing. <laughs> so what kind of memory do you think they used here? The original concept for the ACE was to use these mercury delay lines. Now think about this, right? A mercury delay line is a tube of mercury, fluid, right? and you put a speaker on one end and a microphone on the other, and you pump audio signals in at very high speed, uh, so you, know, you wouldn't actually be able to hear them, high-frequency audio signals into the speaker. The sound waves roar through the mercury, come out the other end where it, the microphone, a transducer, picks them up, and you cycle it around to the beginning of the tube again. This was rotating memory, very much like a disc, except it was sound waves going through the tube. They figured they could get 1024 bits into a tube. That was their goal. They wanted to get 1024 bits into the tube, and then they would have 22 such tubes because this machine was a 22-bit word size machine. So this was going to be a 1024 by 22 machine that they would write code on. They, they, in the end, they had to give this up. They couldn't get the mercury delay lines to work properly. And so they had to fall back on a less efficient option, which was cathode ray tubes. It turns out that if you spray an electron beam at a screen, like a television set does, the beam will leave some residual charge. Actually, it depletes charge. It creates this well of depleted charge on the screen. And then you can sweep the beam over that well and detect the repulsion from the screen in the outgoing beam. And you can see where bits had been written. 
course, that destroys the bits, so then you have to refresh them. So that's kind of cool, and Turing took great use of this because this was his output device. He would read his output on the memory itself by looking on the screen. A bunch of bits, ones and zeros, just hanging out there. Uh, he used a scheme of, uh, not hexadecimal, he used base 32. Base 32 is ideal because all 26 letters of the alphabet and the, and the numbers uh, don't quite add up to, you, know, you get a little bit more characters than that. So he would just uh, do everything in base 32. If he had a big calculation to run, he loved to run weird calculations to find interesting numbers. And he would do it all in base 32. And all of his friends, all of his associates were going, are you going to convert that to decimal? No, why would you do that? It's perfectly obvious in base 32. That was Alan Turing. 1945, this guy, Alan Turing, is writing real code that we would recognize in binary, base 32, reversed, by the way, he wrote it right to left, for whatever reason. He uses integer add and logical not. He invents the concept of a subroutine. While he's working in 1945, he invents the concept of the stack. He does not call the operations push and pop. He calls them bury and unbury. But it was a stack nonetheless. And he also conceives of the idea that the stack would be used to save subroutine return addresses, which was a very novel idea at the time. He invents the concept of floating point numbers. He's got a 22-bit word machine there. He can hold 22-bit integers, but he needs to be able to deal with fractions. So he writes in base 32 a floating point package in a machine that will, it, and it'll fit in this machine that's only got 1024 words. This is pretty impressive stuff. Has anybody here written a floating point package? Go home and write yourself a floating point package. It's a wonderful weekend exercise, honest to God. Figure out how you do all that decimal point shifting and all the exponent stuff. And by the time you're done with that, you'll know you can do anything. <laughs> huh? 1945, Alan Turing writes a report. And in this report, some of the most remarkable words I've seen about this industry appear. Look at this. We shall need a great number of mathematicians of ability. Sorry because there will probably be a good deal of work of this kind to be done. How did he know? There will probably be a good deal of this kind of work to be done. Yes, Alan, I think you're right about that, buddy. How did he know that? And then he says, we'll need a great number of mathematicians of ability. We kind of let him down on that one, I think. <laughs> And then he says this in the same report. One of our difficulties will be in the maintenance of appropriate discipline so that we do not lose track of what we are doing. Again, we failed at that one. What a remarkable couple of things for him to have said in 1945 after just writing a few thousand lines of code in base 32. He understood the problem that we were all going to face for the next 60 years. Mathematicians of ability. Do you consider yourself a mathematician of ability? That's what Turing felt was necessary. A great number of us. Well, there is a great number of us. And appropriate discipline. <laughs> Lost that one. Our industry has been hunting for discipline for a long time, hunting it and rejecting it, because we are also loosey-goosey kind of wild animals who don't like discipline, but we need it. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that, which I'll be going into shortly. 1945, the number of, com number of computers in the world on the order of one. Probably more than one, there were a couple of others, you know, different people who were making computers at the time, but probably no more than four. And the number of programmers in the world by 1945, big O of one. Probably more than one, maybe 10, 12, something like that, but fairly small number of programmers in 1945. What year is it today? Let's see, 45, 55, 65, 75, 85, 95, 
2005, 2015, 71 years. 71 years ago, there was one programmer, one computer. Is that right? 71? Did I do that math right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 1950s. The memory problem is acute. A CRT memory that can store a thousand bits costs well over a thousand dollars. Memory is more than a dollar a bit, probably more than ten dollars a bit. Um, we invent another kind of memory called core. The advantage to core is that it's much denser and it's deeply persistent. These little metal rings here we magnetize them by passing currents through these wires. We can magnetize a single core by passing half the current necessary through that wire and half the current necessary through this wire so that this particular core will become magnetized. And we can magnetize it in one of two directions, north-south or south-north, by passing the current through it in opposite directions. If you magnetize a core, you can detect that it has been magnetized by running the current through those wires in the opposite direction, and if the core flips, it will induce a current on another one of these wires that you see here, and that little wire's got an amplifier on the end that'll see a little spike. And that's the way you know that you've, you've got a bit in memory. Now that destroys the bit, so then you have to rewrite it. Right? But okay, that's fine. The great thing about cores is they're magnets. If you turn the computer off, Mm, all the memory is still there. Turn the computer back on, it's all still there. There's none of this nonsense of, oh my God, I've lost everything. Uh, we used to have, in these machines that used core, we used to have interrupts that would tell us that the power had gone off. And, you know, we were, at that point, we were running on this power that was falling very rapidly, but we had milliseconds. So we would squirrel away all the registers in core, and then we'd just sit there and halt and wait for the power to go down. And then we had another interrupt that would tell us that the power had come up. And when the power came up, we would start to execute again and get all the registers out of core, back into registers, and then start executing again. You could literally walk up to these computers, turn them off, turn them on again, and there'd be no difference to the execution. It would just continue executing. Lovely. This allowed much larger memories. We also got the whole tube problem under control. Tubes got mass produced in the 50s. For all kinds of reasons, computers weren't the only reason. People were starting to listen to radios and stuff like that, and televisions. And, oh my goodness, tubes were everywhere. And so we had this mass production of tubes. They became more reliable, they became smaller, they were lower power. And computers started to be something that people could build more than one of. By 1953, there were enough computers, and there still weren't a lot, for people to think about languages. Now, here you see a little bit of Fortran code. 1953, by the, year, by the way, was the year that Fortran was invented. John Bacchus submitted the Fortran spec in 1953. This is the year after I was born. And this is what Fortran code looks like. Has anybody written Fortran? Oh, look at that. That's good. Fortran code. So, Here's an if statement in Fortran, and notice that it's got a little line number here, which is kind of neat, and the line numbers are not necessarily consecutive, are they? They're not even in order, are they? The line numbers, they were completely arbitrary. You could put any number on any line as long as you didn't repeat the number, and you did not have to put a number on a line if you didn't want the number on the line. The number was just a tag that was used for a go-to. So, for example, look at this if statement here. If IA plus IB minus IC is negative, then jump to line 777. And if it's zero, jump to line 777. And if it's positive, jump to line 704. That was how we did if statements in Fortran in 1953 and 1960 and 1970 and so on. Okay. Uh, you can kind of see the way this code looks. Notice that there's like no indenting. We hadn't invented indenting yet. We didn't know about indenting if statements and things. Uh, we wrote our code on, uh, well, no, we wrote our code on this stuff. That's a coding form. And, and you would write your code in number two pencil in these little squares here with capital letters. And we used a lot of erasers. In this time, 
programmers did not type. We did not know how to type. We would write with our hands in pencil on these coding forms, and then we would take a stack of coding forms and we would hand them to the key punch operators, who all hated us, because we were interfering with their real work, which was data entry. And the key punchers, when they would deign to, would take the coding forms and they would then punch them onto cards, and you'd get a card that looks like this. And then uh, 24 hours later, if you were lucky, you would get your deck back from the key punch operator and you'd take it back to your desk and you would look at every card. You could see the code printed on the top of the card. So you'd just kind of thumb through the cards and make sure the cards were all right, okay. And they weren't because the key punch operators didn't know what they were punching. They were just kind of punching anything that was on the form. And if you weren't careful with your I's and your O's and your sevens, they would print ones and zeros and T's. And so you had to be real careful with that to be real, you know, make sure they understood what you were printing. Uh, you'd take this deck of cards once you eventually got it right, and you'd take it down the hall to the computer room where you'd put it in a basket with a rubber band around it, and put it in the basket, and then you had to back away from the computer room because programmers were not allowed to touch the computer. Programmers were not allowed in the computer room. The computer room was ruled by a different species of human being called a computer operator. And the computer operator did not like programmers and did not allow them near the door because some programmers sometimes leapt in there to touch the computer and they had to be chased out with whips. If you backed away far enough, then the computer operator would open the door slightly and take your deck inside and then shut the door. And then he'd put it in another basket because the computer operator was busy doing real computer stuff. They had jobs to run. They had bills of materials to do and, and, and payroll stuff to do and all this other stuff to do. They were busy. So by maybe three in the morning, one of the third shift's operators would finally see this deck of cards in the basket and say, ah, oh, crap, all right, I'll run this. And put it in the card reader and push a button and read the cards in and compile your program and do whatever test you wanted and print a little printout at the end. And he'd tear the print off off and he'd wrap it around your deck of cards and put a big rubber band around it and haul it out to the table outside and put it outside. And the next day you would come in and there would be this thing on the table and you'd take it to your desk and you'd untake the rubber band off and you know, get the cards set aside and start thumbing through the listing and oh, forgot a comma. It was turnaround time was 24 hours, if you were lucky. Sometimes it was longer than that. And the, the time just to get your deck punched was 24 hours. This was the life of a computer programmer in those days. Now, to deal with that, we worked on five, six, seven programs at the same time. So we'd always have several in the queue. That's the life of a programmer during those days. 1958, Lisp is invented. McCarthy invents Lisp, and a lovely mathematical language that refuses to die. We've tried to kill it over and over again. It keeps coming back. I believe in the end, it will be Lisp that we all program in. <laughs> because every other language has managed to die, except for Lisp. It keeps coming back. So one day we will all face the fact that Lisp is the only true computer language by the way, that was the beginning of functional programming. Func this was the first functional language. Um, and finally, we've begun to actually recognize that functional programming might be important. Many, many, many years later. Between 1954 and 1960, IBM sold 140 Model 709 computers, running Fortran or Lisp or a few other silly little languages. 140 by 1960. Uh, notice who's operating the machine. In 1960, the number of computers in the world was on the order of 100. Might have been 200, might have been 500, might have been 700, but it was on that order. And the number of programmers was on the order of 1,000 because in those days, a single computer required 10 or 12 or 15 programmers to keep it running. We had no operating systems. We had no function libraries. We had no frameworks. If any code ran on those machines, we wrote it. So 
We needed a lot of programmers to keep those machines alive. Who were these programmers in the 1950s? Well, they weren't trained in school. They weren't CS grads. They were engineers and mathematicians and scientists that were drawn from the industries they had been working on. And, and they were old. They weren't young. They were in their 30s and 40s and maybe their 50s. They, they were people who were mature. They understood projects. They understood schedules. They didn't need a lot of management. They were people who'd been around the block a lot. They were people that their companies trusted. The transistor was born, and the transistor replaced the tube. And the transistor was more reliable than the tube and drew much less power than the tube and could be mass-produced more cheaply than the tube. And so very rapidly, the transistor dominated the market. By 1965, there were 10,000 1401 computers. 1401 computer was a really interesting machine. It was a decimal machine. IBM had made the decision that everything should be done in decimal. Now, you can't do it in decimal. You still have to do it in binary. So they used binary-coded decimal. And they took this to a very interesting extreme. If you bought a 4K 1401, you got 4000 bytes. Not 4096, 4000. The address space was decimal. That's how far they took this. They would rent these machines for $2,500 a month which sounds like a lot, especially when you think that that really amounts to 20K per day, but it was enough for companies to consider bringing a machine like that into their facilities and dealing with their information management problems. So com companies started to buy or rent these machines. And by 1965, the numbers of, number of computers in the world was on the order of 10,000, probably four, more like 50,000. And the number of programmers was probably on the order of 100,000. Now, it has been less than 20 years since Turing wrote his first line of code. And we're approaching 100,000 programmers, probably more. And by this time, I'm 13 years old. From 1945 to 1965, 20 years, there's perhaps 100,000 programmers in the world, maybe two or 300,000. Where did all these people come from? They didn't graduate from school. Well, they might have, but they didn't graduate with a computer degree. There were no computer degrees. There weren't enough. There weren't enough engineers, scientists, and mathematicians. There weren't any computer science grads. So, Companies had to draw the programmers from the best and brightest in whatever field they could get them from, uh, accountants, planners, clerks, anybody with a technical bent, anybody who might think in that funny way that programmers think, and if the company trusted them enough, they would be brought in as programmers. They would be moved from their current job to a programming job. And these people were, again, older, more mature, they understood the business they were in. They'd been in that business for a long time already. They already understood management. They understood schedules and deadlines. These were not 22-year-old kids out of school. Though not mathematicians, they were experienced, disciplined professionals. And I like to think that Turing would have approved he might, not, he might have shirked and said, well, they're not mathematicians, but at least they're disciplined. 1966. IBM is producing 1,000 360s every month. I actually worked on machines like this one. I worked on an IBM 360-30 and an IBM 360-40. Uh, the 30 had 16K of, of core, 16K bytes. By this time, we had identified that there was a thing called a byte. Right? And it had 16K. That one was kind of out in the lab where you could sort of touch it. And then there was an IBM 360-40 that had 64K. That was back in the computer room. You weren't allowed to touch that one. 64K was an infinite amount of memory. I've, I remember when we got our first megabyte. It was later than this. And a megabyte would have fit... See that blue 
box over there. This is roughly the size of a restaurant freezer. That would have been what a megabyte looked like. And you didn't go near it because it rented for tens of thousands of dollars a month. If you wanted to buy it, it would have been tens of millions of dollars to buy. It was a very valuable piece of equipment. Thousands upon thousands of these IBM 360s were created. This is probably the most successful product of IBM's history. Billions of dollars were made by selling these computers to companies. By 1966, same era, Ole Johandal and Christian Nygaard, operating out of Oslo, created the Simula 67 language, which was the very first object-oriented language. So it was in this era that object orientation was created. We already had functional programming. That came 10 years before. By 1968, Edgar Dijkstra had written his famous paper, Go To Considered Harmful, and had begun the structured revolution. Structured programming began during this era. The, ma the three major movements in our industry, functional, structured, and object, were all begun in the late 50s and the 60s by these people who were professionals, disciplined, who had come into the field for doing other things first. Here you've got Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, 1968. We're still only 22 years after the first code had been written. These guys are sitting in the basement of AT&T. They're coming up with C and Unix. These guys were disciplined mathematicians. 1970, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, produces 50,000 PDP-8s, and it's not the only mini-computer being made by then. This is during the era when just about everybody was making mini-computers. Loads of people were making them. Varian was making them. Everybody was making these mini-computers. The 50,000 was just the tip of the iceberg. The number of computers in the world in 1970 is probably on the order of, of 100,000, maybe a million by this time. The number of programmers in the world has got to be over a million. How many years have gone by? 25? 1945 to 1970, million programmers. Who were they? Who were these people? These millions of programmers, hundreds of thousands of computers, millions of programmers. Who were they? I was one of them. This is the years, these were the years that I started writing software. These are the years that I got a job. That's me at the uh, tender age of 18. Actually, I think I was 19 there. Already a programmer, by the way. Already hired as a programmer to work at a place near my home writing COBOL. God help me. By 1970, tens of thousands of new computer science and double E grads were starting to come out of the schools. There were now computer science courses that you could take in college. And the, the, the perception in the industry was, the perception amongst the, the students was, this was the career. If you could get into computers, you were going to do well. And they were right, of course. That was a great, great career decision to make. Tens of thousands of CS and EE grads, they all had something in common. We were all young and we were almost all male. Something weird had happened. The male domination had begun right around here. It peaked in the 80s, but it started here. I remember being in high school, touching computers in high school. We had a, a, a teletype that would hook him to a, a computer at, a, at the Inst Illinois Institute of Technology. And all of the people interested in that computer stuff were boys of my age. One or two girls, but almost always boys. It was a male-dominated thing very early on at this era. At my first job, there were about 24 programmers, most of them in their 30s or 40s, and half of them were women. That was at that place where I was doing COBOL. But 10 years later, my employer had 50 programmers. All of us in our 20s or early 30s, three of them were women at that time. And that ratio stayed roughly about that, didn't it, James? There were quite a few uh, ladies in paradigm in the 80s. In the 80s. There were a few. So we had, um, let's see if we can name them. We had uh, Kathy, Kathy Stutz, Kathy Lakari, 
And we had Allison Mann. And then Renu Bala and Bama Rao. And Denise, Denise Rosen. Uh, and um, there was a woman in her 40s. Didn't really last very long. What was her name? Who? Wendy Teller. Wendy Teller, that's right. The daughter of the Italian father. No, was, was she related to... Yes. Who? <laughs> I should have been a little more polite to her. She, she, was, she was related to Edward Teller. <laughs> Great. Okay. Sister. sister of the Italian She was Edward Teller's sister? No. No, his daughter. Oh, okay. All right, all right. That's fascinating. I didn't know. So this is James Grenning. Uh, James Grenning and I have worked together for an immensely long time. Uh, he and I were together very, very early in both of our careers. Uh, and he had, he's here, he's kindly agreed to show up, and I thought I would tweak him on this. Can you remember any other women's names? It was a long time ago. But remarkably, you and I can remember their names. Now shall we name all the men? <laughs> we did have... Women programmers. But the majority, the vast majority, were men. Or boys, I should say. This is the curve that has become somewhat famous lately of women in scientific fields. All of these curves are women in scientific fields. This is the curve of women in computer science. Something strange is going on there. I don't know exactly what it is. And you can see there's this kind of weird peak in 1985. Business had to have programmers. And what young men may lack in discipline, they make up for with energy. They can work crazy hours. They get really hyper-focused. Sometimes not on the right things. And they're cheap. My first job as a programmer uh, was for $6,800 a year. I, you know, at the age of 18, that's a heck of a lot of money. I could buy a car. I couldn't move out of my house. But I could buy a car. That was cool. You know? uh, later on, I found out that that was dirt. But I didn't know it then. Huh? Now remember, up to now, programmers had been disciplined professionals, hired out of other job functions, they were generally older, they were more disciplined and more mature. They didn't need a lot of management or process. They knew how to manage their time and communicate and work together. They understood deadlines and commitments and what to leave in and what to leave out. They knew all that stuff. They had worked miracles, these older programmers, this first cohort of programmers. They gave us the IBM 360 virtual memory operating system. They got us to the moon. They invented structured programming and functional programming and object-oriented programming. They gave us Fortran and COBOL and ALGOL and LISP and C and UNIX, this older cohort of programmers. And those original programmers apparently knew how to get big things done. What process might they have used? And, and it's interesting to speculate that had we gone back to those times and watched them, we would recognize what they were doing as some kind of agile process. Because it has been said that agile is the process used by disciplined professionals observed in the wild. Now, we know a little bit about what they did. We know, for example, that the space shuttle programmers worked in iterations of six weeks. That seems long to us, but six weeks is still an interesting iteration. They actually closed their cycles every six weeks. We know that the programmers on the Mercury space capsule made their unit tests, wrote their unit tests in the morning and made them pass in the afternoon, a kind of foreshadowing of test-driven development. We can see all of this stuff through fuzzy glasses as we look back in time. But hordes of young, testosterone-driven boys need discipline imposed upon them from above. And what better discipline than the waterfall model? In 1970, Winston Royce creates this model. He creates it 
as a straw man to say, hey, this doesn't work. But nobody apparently listened to him because they took his picture, and that is his picture right there, stolen right out of his original paper, and they copied it and pasted it, with real paste, by the way, um, into documents of the day. And waterfall became the kind of default process. And I speculate here that the reason behind that was that the average age of the programmer had dropped by 10 years. We were now dealing with a lot of boys in their 20s, and you have to give them some kind of process. Looking back to look ahead, we're 1970 now. The waterfall era had begun, and it would stay for 30 years. And what would happen to all those programmers in that 30-year time frame? Programmers like me and James. Yeah, and then, and then not became managers. Yeah, yeah. I speculate that the number of programmers doubles every five years. This is the only way to rationalize the fact that we started with one programmer in 1945, and we now have hundreds of millions. So there's clearly some kind of exponential growth curve here. And you can do, so I did some research to look at old um, job postings and headhunter reports and things like that, and I came up with this very rough figure that our population doubles every five years. Which means that we have, by the 1995, tens of millions of programmers, half of whom have less than five years' experience. If we're doubling every five years, then we always have half the programmers with less than five years' experience, which leaves our industry in a state of perpetual inexperience. We cannot escape from this as long as we are doubling every five years. And that leads to a very unfortunate situation. There aren't enough teachers to teach the new people coming in. And so the new people coming in must repeat the mistakes made by everyone else over and over and over and over. And there seems to be no cure for this. Now, what's changed? Well, the hardware's changed. The hardware has changed. Think of the difference between the ACE and my laptop. Or you don't even have to go back that far. Think of the difference between a PDP-8 and my laptop. PDP-8 could execute a half a million instructions per second. My laptop can go 10,000 times faster. 10,000 times faster. PDP-8 had 4K of core. That thing's got 16 gigabytes of RAM, and that's considered small nowadays. PDP-8 had 32K words of disk. That thing has a terabyte of SSD. Not even a disk anymore. Just a terabyte of solid state memory. And if you add up all the differences, you can very easily convince yourself that that machine there is 22 orders of magnitude more powerful than a PDP-8. I have lived through 22 orders of magnitude of growth in the hardware. James, do you remember um, um, the article that um, speculated about the iPhone that was written by Jack Gansel? And if I remember correctly, Jack, Jack wrote this series of articles. It was really fun. At the end of the series of articles, he said, OK, now here's an iPhone. How many transistors are in here? And he speculates. He says, at least a trillion. At least a trillion, trillion transistors in here. Now, what if you did that in tubes? You'd need a trillion tubes. Now you can do some very interesting math. How big a building would you need to house a trillion tubes? And the math there works out to be, uh, I believe it was, 170 vehicle assembly buildings. The big building at NASA? Yeah, the biggest building in the world, 170 of those, just to house the tubes. It would mass as much as 2,500 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers, the biggest aircraft carrier made. It would require a lot of power at one watt per tube. It would require a terawatt, requiring us to build, um, what, 500 two-gigawatt nuclear power plants, the biggest nuclear power plants we built. It would cost, well, 
50 bucks a tube, $50 trillion. <laughs> the economic output of the world. And once you had built it, there would be no one to call. <laughs> I hold in my hand the economic output of the world in 1950, and we produce them in lots of hundreds of millions and give them away for your signature on a two-year contract. That is the level of change that we have experienced in a man's lifetime. <clears throat> and the demographics have changed. The demographics have shifted. It is mostly men now, not so many women. And the age has dropped. The average programmer is less than 30. It's a problem. It's an issue. What hasn't changed, and this one you won't like, what hasn't changed is the software. You would recognize the code that Alan Turing wrote in the ACE machine. You wouldn't like it, but you would recognize it. You would recognize Fortran code. You wouldn't like that much either, but you could follow it. You could read it. You could write it. I could take a man or a woman from 1968, a PDP-8 programmer, and I could bring them forward in time and put them in front of my laptop and show them IntelliJ. And they would need 24 hours or so to recover from the shock. <laughs> but they could write the code. I could show them Java, and they go, oh, yeah, Java, okay. Well, that's kind of interesting, huh? I mean, the tool is great, but the language, uh, you know. <laughs> And I said, well, what, I mean, what about objects? Oh, yeah, that's that stuff that uh, Nygaard and Dahl were doing back in 67, wasn't it? Not that revolutionary. They could write the code. I could take you, and I could transport... I can't do this, but if I could, I would transport you back into 1968, put you in front of a PDP-8 uh, with a teletype that ran 10 characters per second and show you how to edit code on paper tape. And you would require 24 hours to recover from the disappointment. <laughs> but you could write the code. Because the code is assignment statements, if statements, and while loops. And it has been that way, and it will be that way. That's what the code is. And we like to scramble it in different languages, this way and that, and put types around it, and put other stuff around it, and generics, and see how many really weird generic kind of things we can make. But it turns into assignment statements, if statements, and while loops. And that's what our software is. If we have made any advances in software since 1945, it is almost entirely in what not to do. Structured programming was in what not to do. Don't use unrestrained go-to. Functional programming, don't use assignment. Object-oriented programming, don't use pointers to functions. What we have learned over the last 70-some years is more about what not to do than what to do. There have been no radical advances in software technology. The craft of writing software remains roughly the same as it was in 1945. A little more modern, but not essentially any different. The hardware is changing like crazy. We're getting into multi-core now. We've got massive parallelism to deal with. And please don't talk to me about quantum computers, because I don't believe that we're going to be seeing an awful lot of quantum computers in the near future any time soon. Uh, they can't seem to stabilize a qubit for more than a few milliseconds. And even if they do, there is only a certain subset of algorithms that even apply to quantum computing. So I'm not too excited about that, except when they start breaking codes. Then I'll get excited. What must change for us is our level of professionalism, a level that we lost because of the incoming flood of young people, and something we're going to have to reclaim. Some kind of level of discipline, which we don't have much of. The original cohort of disciplined professionals retires in 1995. All those old guys who got a whole bunch of really cool stuff done retires right around then. And the first wave of career programmers, like James and myself, 
come of age at well over 40, and we foresee a change is needed. And James and I and several other people, like Ken Schwaber, Mike Beadle, Martine DeVoe, Kent Beck, Ward Cunningham, Pete Code, Alistair Coburn, all of these people begin to realize that this waterfall era we've been in is probably going to have to change. And so we all meet. And we meet at a place called Snowbird in 2001, and we write a manifesto called the Agile Manifesto. I went back there a few years ago. Uh, a client of mine in Utah said, hey, it would be cool to go back to that room. And I said, I don't even know where the doggone room is. And they said, well, we think we know. And they took me up the mountain, and we went into the resort. And sure enough, there was the room. And I wrote on the board roughly what we had written on the board during that time, and I took this picture. Here's the real picture. This is the picture that Ward Cunningham took. And you can see Martin Fowler up here. That's Martin. You can recognize Martin by that crazy beard that he has. And that's me right there. And I believe James is here. That's Ron Jeffries. I think that's you, James. I'm not sure. I know you're in this picture somewhere. There's the uh, Agile Manifesto. These four lines that for some reason captured the attention of the world uh, in, in a lot more than we thought they'd do. We just kind of went to that meeting and we, we wrote that down and went home. And you know, never that, that group of people never met again uh, and don't want to. <laughs> Except I'm happy to see James. Agile requires discipline. It is um, often thought of as a process, but it's not a process. Right? It requires discipline. It requires attention to detail. You have to work in fixed time boxes. You can't stretch those time boxes around. You have to estimate in relative units. You have to communicate with the customer. You have to do continuous integration and collaboration and so many more things. These are disciplines, not process steps. They are promises you make. They are not tasks to follow. Extreme programming was the most disciplined of them all of the Agile processes. It included things like test-driven development and refactoring and simple design and acceptance tests and metaphor. Again, disciplines, promises that you would f make to follow. Ethical statements, statements of morality. I will write tests. Many of us thought that these technical disciplines were the glue that made the whole Agile process work, that Agile without the technical disciplines was empty, was devoid of character or devoid of promise, that you might be able to make a mess in a hurry, but you can't really get real work done in a hurry. We thought of these technical disciplines as Turing's mathematical discipline, the same kind of thing that Turing suggested we have in 1945. And we thought that without these technical disciplines, we would lose track of what we were doing. Turing said discipline and ability, and Agile was about discipline, and it was about craftsmanship, and it was about professionalism. Now, business understands discipline. Any business understands discipline. You can't run a business without discipline. And so business really liked Scrum. They liked Scrum because of the discipline. They liked Scrum because it was simple and obvious, and you could, you could do these little sprints, and you could do all these meetings, and you could do all this planning, and it made sense to the business. And the business thought, yes, this certification thing is a great idea. We need to certify people. But the business does not understand us. It doesn't understand programmers. And in particular, the business does not understand our disciplines. Business understands scrum disciplines. Business doesn't understand pair programming. Doesn't understand test-driven development. Doesn't understand refactoring. Doesn't understand simple design. These te technical disciplines 
are not within the, the expertise of business. And, and they shouldn't be. They belong to us. That's part of our tech expertise. So business cannot approve or endorse them. You cannot go to the business and say, <clears throat> is it okay if we write tests? You can't do that. Because when you do that, what you are trying to do is shed the risk. You are not willing to take the risk. You put it on the business. And the business cannot evaluate that and take the risk. So, of course, they will deny you. I'm not taking that risk. You can't go to the business and say, is it okay if we refactor? Because you are shedding the risk. And the risk, frankly, is ours to take. We own that risk. That is us. We are the ones who know that things need to be tested. We are the ones who know that things need to be refactored. We are the ones who know how to get software done, and so we have to take the risk as part of our normal professional operation, as professionals. And that's what a professional does. A professional takes the risk on what they know what must be done. Unfortunately, we don't all agree. Programmers aren't sure they know what their technical disciplines really ought to be. And lately, we have seen papers like TDD is Dead, written by David Hanemeyer Hansen, and we saw another one recently called TDD, I Gave Up, and then there's another one, a pairing, no. Okay, we don't agree. We got a real problem on our hands, because we don't agree on our own technical disciplines. Without technical disciplines, Scrum turns into what Martin Fowler called flaccid scrum. Scrum that has no body, no character. Scrum that cannot deliver repeatedly because the technical excellence is gone. Scrum without technical practices becomes an efficient business discipline coupled to an undisciplined engineering team and very rapidly causes a mess to be made. And then there was the invasion of the project managers, caused by certification. Certification turned into this kind of um, siren song, and it attracted, frankly, all the wrong people. Agile was developed by technical people. It was a, 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 a creation of the software industry. Programmers sat in that room and created the Agile Manifesto and the Agile Principles. And then came certification. And with certification, hordes and hordes of project managers started to get certified. And they would sit for two days in a class and get a piece of paper and feel that that was somehow significant. And they literally took over the Agile movement. The Agile movement shifted dramatically towards the project management side. So when you think now about the stuff going on in Agile, you're thinking about Kanban and you know, lean this and you know, lean startup that. And you know, Where's the technical discipline? Where's the programmers? And frankly, the programmers have all fled. If you go to the Agile conference now, you don't see an awful lot of programmers there. And you don't see a lot of technical tracks there, although they try. But it's dominated heavily by the business people, by the business, the project managers. And this has caused an interesting split. An interesting split between those people who started a craftsmanship movement and those who maintain the Agile practice. The craftsmanship movement was an, almost an act of rebellion. It was a group of people saying, wait a minute, we've, we still have a voice here. We still have something to say, and, and we need to talk to these Agile people and get them to integrate with us, and that did not happen. And that's ironic, because Kent Beck said something at Snowbird. Perhaps you remember this, James. He said, um, the goal for Agile was to heal the divide between business and programming. The reason we wanted to do Agile was to bring those two groups together, and I believe that's completely failed, at least from the point of view of the movement. Maybe not in individual offices and individual projects. It may be working fine there, but the movement itself has split. 
So what's going to have to change? Well, one thing is that we, the agile community, is going to have to grow up. We're going to have to define our profession. We programmers are going to have to define our profession. We're going to have to choose our practices and disciplines. Is it going to be test-driven development? Is it going to be pair programming? Is it going to be simple design and continuous integration and continuous deployment? Are those our disciplines? Let's pick them. Let's choose. Let's decide what it means to be a programmer. What are the professional disciplines? We're going to have to reunify the whole agile and craftsmanship movement, and we're going to have to lead. Somebody is going to have to lead because there's a problem. We are facing a disaster, and it's a disaster of somewhat large proportions. Civilization depends on us. Civilization doesn't understand this yet. We don't understand it yet, but I want you to think carefully. How many times per day does your grandmother interact with a software system? And at first you might think, well, she doesn't do anything in software. Well, she probably buys things. And you cannot buy something without interacting with the software system. And you cannot sell anything without interacting with the software system. You cannot get insurance. You can't make a telephone call. You can't watch a TV show. You cannot get into your car without inter interacting with the software system. You cannot turn on your microwave oven. You can't turn on your refrigerator. You can't wash your clothes without interacting with a software system. Anything you do in the modern world, you are interacting with a software system. Anybody know how many lines of code are in a modern car? 10 million in the vault. 10 million in the vault. 10 million lines of code. That should scare the hell out of you. <laughs> and of course, not all of it is in the engine and stuff like that. Some of it's in the, in the um, uh, entertainment system and the GPS system and a whole bunch of software in there. But there is software that controls the throttle, if there is a throttle. There is, a, there is software that controls the brake. Did you know that when you step on the brake, there is software in that loop? When you step on the accelerator, there is software in that loop. My wife has a car which has a front-looking camera and it can see the lane markings on the road. And if she begins to drift over the lane markings, the software in that system will pull the steering wheel back. There's software that can control the steering wheel. <sighs> How many people have been killed by cars? Software in cars that have gone bad. Dozens. Dozens. There have been a number of people where the cars just run completely out of control. The brake won't work, the accelerator's down on the floor, the car accelerates out of control and smashes into something. There have been uh, several dozen of those. There was actually a big suit not too long ago where Toyota had to pay out an awful lot of money because people were being killed and more were being injured because of software in cars. We are killing people. We did not get into this business to kill people, but we are killing people. And this is only getting worse and worse and worse. Our, so our civilization depends on us. And they don't get it yet, and we don't get it yet. Although, there are hints. Did any of you watch the CEO of Volkswagen North America testifying before Congress as he blamed a couple of software developers for cheating the EPA? Oh, yeah, it was a couple of software developers who did it for whatever reason. What a great line. Whatever reason. <laughs> now, the weird part about that is that it was a couple of software developers, maybe more than two, but it was software developers who wrote that code. It was us who wrote that code to cheat. Some programmers wrote cheating code. Do you think they knew? If in test mode, <laughs> I think they probably knew. That's a problem. We rule the world. The world doesn't know this yet. We don't quite know it yet. Other people believe that they rule the world, but they write the rules down and they hand them to us. And then we write the rules that go into the machines that execute everything that happens on this planet nowadays. No law can be enacted without software. No law can be enforced without software. 
No government can act without software. We rule the world. And one day, one of us is going to do something dumb, and maybe not even that dumb, and the result will be a catastrophe where tens of thousands of people die. And you could imagine what it would be. I mean, there's a whole bunch of possibilities there. A plane crashes into a, a football stadium. And when this happens, and it will happen, it has to happen, it's just a matter of time. When this happens, the politicians of the world will rise up, as they should, in righteous indignation, which they should have, and they will point their fingers right at us, and they will ask us the question, how could you have let this happen? They won't point at our managers, because our managers will say, oh, there's some software guys who did it for whatever reason. <laughs> they will point at us. And they will ask us this question, and we'd better have an answer for them. Because if our answer is, well, my boss made me do that, that is not going to fly. That is not going to be a good enough answer. Oh, we had to make a deadline. Sorry, no. That is not going to work. And if that is our answer, then the politicians of the world will do the only thing they can do. They will legislate. They will pass sweeping regulations. They will tell us what languages we have to use and what platforms we have to use, what processors we have to use, what processes we have to follow, what books we have to read, what courses we have to pass, what signatures we have to get. They will regulate us because we've, we're dangerous. We kill people. We may be able to avoid that. And the way we would avoid that is by getting there first, regulate ourselves. Get in the way of that process, like most other industries have done. Develop principles and ethics. Decide who we are and what our disciplines are. Set some level of of basic moral discipline that all of us refuse to go below. This means saying no to your boss sometimes. This is, means taking an oath like a doctor would take an oath or a lawyer would take an oath, where your boss says, you do this, and you say, no, that violates my oath. I will not do that. We're going to have to probably create some kind of body that can enforce this stuff, a body that has the power to say, you are not a programmer anymore because you violated these rules, like any doctor would might get violated, or any lawyer might get disbarred. That is very likely the future of programming, where we leave the era of the youthful mode and become a true profession with a true professional body and a set of morals and disciplines that we follow so that we can stave off the worst that what government will likely do to us. And that is the end of my talk. <laughs> Are there any questions?